Hello, it's uh, an incredible honor to be in this room full of, of world changers, um, but difficult because I'm sandwiched between two of my great, greatest heroes, Mary Robinson and Al Gore, and then following a courageous teenager. <laughs> Uh, but I have had uh, tremendous opportunities as well. As one of the first women photographers for National Geographic, I had half the world to myself in many ways because I could be with the women. And I've been with the women in about 150 countries. And I have learned so much from them. I've been also saddened that we um, underestimate these women and their stories are underreported. So five years ago, I gathered together some of my brilliant colleagues and we started to focus on those underreported stories. Um, the simple fact is, if we want women to be valued in the world, we have to show their value. And my favorite story about this was when I was in um, India and, and I was at a place that was testing clean cook stoves. And uh, when I left, the, I, I walked out of the house, this woman's house, and there was beautiful Hindi writing over the doorway. And I said, oh, it must be a poem or something. So I said, what does that mean? And the aid worker said, well, that's her name. And I said, that's her name? And she said, yes. And I said, well, how does her husband feel about that? And she said, he got a house. And it's been a motivator ever since. One of the things that very few people know is that 70% of those who die in any climate disaster are women. They are simply the last to leave, whether they're in Bangladesh, where the land is falling away, or in many of the drought-stricken regions. They're the last to close the door and leave because the men usually go on ahead and the women are left behind to bring along the kids and often their parents, the elderly. They're just carrying too big a load. They're also responsible for water gathering. And uh, as water disappears and, and uh, is further and further you know, from where they live, we've covered programs where women are actually walking as much as uh, 11 hours a day to get awful water. And of course, the girls can't possibly go to school. And uh, and yet there are solutions, and our organization is very focused on solutions because we really believe in women, and we know with a little engineering and sometimes a little cement uh, or a cell phone that helps them uh, market what they're, what they're creating, they can change their own world. And I've seen the most successful programs are where the women themselves are in charge of the programs. There, you know, there is, is this not fierce? They are uh, smart and funny and incredibly resourceful and amazingly hardworking. And so the programs that teach them how to deal with some of the obstacles are just so exciting and so hopeful. This is in Benin where women watch their children starve basically four to six months of every year and with a little engineering to move water from wells into uh, drip irrigation gardens. These women now sing about their fat babies. And if you teach a woman just basic things about which, you know, that beans will be better for her kids than potatoes, she'll do it. She'll do it. She's so invested in her kids. And of course, when we solve these problems, like building sand dams, bringing water sources closer to, for women to harvest from, the girls go to school. And education, I think, is the single biggest way out of um, you know, climate change disasters. Even if, if women haven't been blessed with an education, they can be trained, they can be taught to find a new endeavor, a new uh, entrepreneurship that doesn't depend on the, the ground that's either falling away beneath their feet or that is um, blowing away in the wind. One of the, one of the stories that I think everyone in this room is sort of familiar with, but I have been astonished at how little the scale is discussed, is the story of indoor pollution. 
It is currently the number one killer of women in the developing world and also of children under age five. The, um, and we hear about it, but I don't think we've ever, you know, there isn't a, a general knowledge of this and shouldn't, shouldn't everyone know this? And behind these numbers, 4.3 million every year, is, is something that uh, is solvable, preventable, it just takes the will and the support to do it. And um, when you think about it, 4.3 million deaths is more than die from AIDS, dysentery, uh, malaria, and childbirth combined, combined. And yet we just, it should be on the front page. And you know, kids are dying because they, especially the infants who are the most vulnerable, have to be with their mothers. And their mothers are spending so much of each day either going for fuel or living in this smoky world that's literally choking the life out of them. And you know, there are toxic fuels like kerosene that, it, you know, it, everyone knows what that can do to, to the lungs, to the brain. Um, and yet, it's the only option for so many women. And another thing that I am keenly aware of, because I spend so much time with women in their kitchens, is that their dignity and their self-esteem is hugely damaged because their kids are always coughing and sick, they always feel dirty, and, um, and they're hidden away. I've worked with a, a wonderful doctor, Dr. Colby from the Mayo Clinic, and we were trying to figure out why don't even physicians know this? And he said to me that in the pathology world, it's referred to as hut lung, H-U-T. So dismissive, heartbreakingly dismissive. And, um, it, and we, we figured out together that the research is usually done either on cigarettes in the Western world or on occupational hazards. But nobody's going home with the women. Nobody's really measuring what the toll is on that population. And talk about false economy if we don't fix this. The, the loss of productivity, the, um, the, the medical expenses and losses are simply overwhelming. And women are the key to turning it around. We know that you know, one, of the, one of the side effects of, of uh, always having open flames are burns and buildings that burn down. And um, you know, it, it takes a horrible toll, especially on children. So what happens is the women, after the, their infants are on them and breathing these fuels, then they don't even want their kids to come in the kitchen. And so many women I've talked to have said, well, they feed their kids in the, um, in the bedroom. They eat on the bed so they won't be near the smoke. And of course, we all know that these fuels take a, a huge toll on the environment because of deforestation. And clean cooking solutions use a fraction of the fuel. And then, once again, the women's time can be better spent on some kind of a little business and, um, and taking care of her family. And also, the daughters, once again, will go to school. The best solutions I have seen are solutions where the women are invested themselves. It's not that we come in and we dump off 100,000 cook stoves. It's much more that the women are, you know, have a business in a bag, that, as they do with Solar Sister, or they, the factories are local, so that the people of the community are invested in the solution and making sure that if things aren't working, they can fix them, and that they're, they're their sisters and their communities know about it and see the happiness that these cook stoves can bring to their, their lives and the health that it can bring to their children. So I am asking everyone here if there's any way that you can help. I'm just a photographer um, and I work with a great group of, of storytellers and I just want to move this issue forward so that the world knows, so that my aunt in Nebraska knows, so that everybody is aware of how crucial this issue is. Thank you very much.